you very much. It's, uh, as Tomas mentioned, uh, I, I, I'm slightly under the weather. <clears throat> Those of you who are in the PDF statistics session yesterday already know this. Um, I won't uh, drag on any much any further about that, except to say that uh, for everybody else who's going to be using this podium after me, I wash my hands carefully this morning, and I'm using hand sanitizer. I recommend everybody uses hand sanitizer all the time. It, particularly good for those of us who've had transplants. Uh, that's not all of you, I grant you, but uh, for, for those of us who have, such as myself, it's a very important thing. Okay, so I'm here to talk a little bit about my story about uh, PDF, or, or, or my story with PDF, I should say, and, and um, thinking about what it's meant in my life, and uh, the things that I've learned in the process of being the uh, project leader for PDF 2.0, ISO 32000 Part 2. Some of this uh, discussion is a little eclectic. I'm going to throw a couple of jokes. You are all supposed to laugh at the jokes. Um, <laughs> there, there is a form, a disclosure form. You're OK. You're supposed to laugh at the jokes. All right, so let's get going here. Um, I'm going to run through a few of the different little highlights, uh, I guess, that have occurred to me in the last 22 years or so of uh, my history with PDF. Um, there, but through the, the idea of interoperability, what inspired me to be interested in PDF <clears throat> as opposed to any other particular technology for what I was trying to do. Uh, my business background a little bit with service bureaus of software companies and uh, what on earth I was doing in the software in the standards development space. So why was a political consultant working with electronic document standards? Well, who's the political consultant, right? I, I was. It, it, impossible to believe at this point, even, or I suppose particularly for myself. Uh, but yes, it's true, and I, I worked for, uh, oops, wrong slide. Um, I worked for a variety of organizations, um, but I can see that I'm, this is my mental issue here, is I'm getting ahead of myself. Why don't I just let the slides tell my story, and I'll talk along with them a little bit better. But we're going to come back to this political consultant business. First of all, interoperability. Okay, I was, uh, I'm a, a naturally interoperable, so to speak, because I was born in the United States. I grew up in the United Kingdom, and I still hold both passports. I have to get along with people from both sides of the pond. Um, that's, uh, that was my background in the, in the sort of fundamental value structure that, that undergirds our technology. Um, right from the beginning, I was really interested in, 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 in how things worked between people. So here I am with my sister. Uh, I was occasionally tr creating trouble uh, in my household that, that, that did come up from time to time. And there I had a consumer of trouble. So here we have the interoperability story right there with, um, with somebody making trouble and somebody consuming it. This is more or less what we do in this industry every day, isn't it? So yes, uh, as I gave away the game a little bit a while ago, I was actually a political consultant. What does that really mean? Well, to begin with, how did I get to being a political consultant? I started, I, I didn't, so to speak, start, but I did, after graduating college, I, I went to Alaska and I, I tried my hand at being a commercial fisherman, uh, working on long line boats uh, uh, out in the, in the uh, near, out in, uh, actually in Canada initially, and then in Alaska. Sir, um, fishing for halibut and gray cod and so on, and didn't, didn't work out for me too well. Uh, didn't see an enormous amount of growth potential in the commercial fishing industry, and the chances of, of you know catching yourself with a hook or going overboard, a little bit too high for my preference. So I changed all that. And in 1992, I, I wound up, uh, through total coincidence, a friend of a friend knew, knew a friend, and I wound up working uh, at a reasonably high level on uh, the so campaign of Paul Songus for president. Now, those of you who are not from the US and who weren't around and paying attention to politics back in 1992 don't remember who Paul was. That's OK. Um, he was a great guy, and I was very proud to, to work for him at the time and, um, and enjoyed that process immensely and began to understand in the process of working in politics from a very young age the significance of documents. So. I couldn't, I couldn't uh, stop, really, with the Songus campaign. And after he lost, he was running for president. He actually won a number of states. And we lost, of course, to Bill Clinton in 1992. But uh, losing didn't stop me, which is perhaps why I keep coming back and back to so many other kinds of things. And I really enjoyed campaigning. I worked on more campaigns. I 
managed field operations and opposition research in, in a race in Colorado, and I managed a campaign in Virginia, another one in Wisconsin, and I wound up overseas in the, in the Caribbean uh, uh, helping or assisting with op research and field operations in, in other various countries. And I started to really notice documents in a significant way. The power of documents, the mere fact of a printed page or even a handwritten page to change something, to change minds, to prove a point, to uh, get a particular, to spend a, a chunk of money, to, to alter something in the world. Documents, remarkably powerful. They, uh, they're used for such a wide variety of things and, and, they, and we don't, so many things that we don't really have much terminology or, or, or spend much time thinking about the significance of documents in our lives. We, we draft and collab because they're, they're just the, the stuff of our lives. We don't really think about air either. We breathe it all the time every day, just try and stop using air, right? And documents are kind of similar. You just organically believe and understand and know and act as if you can commit a thought to paper or to a PDF and you can deliver it to somebody else, share it with them, and they'll get a similar experience. So we use documents for drafting and recording and sharing with other people and for proving that we've done something and for referencing another point and for deciding issues and then committing that decision. So much so that when I, 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 I go look, I went looking for, I thought to myself, this is an easy thing to do, and indeed it is. Um, classic marketing imagery for knowledge workers, as I say in the caption here, is all about documents, right? You, this, is, this is just a typical off-the-shelf uh, piece of, of art you can buy from anywhere for about 10 bucks. And um, it is nothing more, nothing less than a bunch of people working what is their work, right? They're pushing around pieces of paper and pointing at things and marking things and adding up things and, and doing stuff that all of it has to do with documents. There must be something here of interest to me, a political consultant who's, well, I enjoyed the work. It's, believe me, it's really hard. It's 20 hours a day. Uh, you, you, they're, they're, and it's not paid particularly well, uh, with some very few exceptions. So um, there must have been something better to do. Okay, so let's go from politics to electronic document solutions. It's documents are such a big deal, since they're so important. This, this makes perfect sense, right? So I was working in the opposition, in terms of politics, I was working in opposition research, which means to say, and I'm not sure what you, what you know about opposition research, but it's probably not as exciting Okay, it's definitely not as exciting as you might imagine. It has to do with examining the public record of yourself and your opponent. To the extent that it involves going around and going through the dumpster behind their office and trying to find stuff that they're trying to hide in there, that's, that's pretty minor. Um, it almost never happens at all. It's not necessary. In general, the, the, the things that people are most embarrassed about are some way or another in, included in, in terms of, you know, legitimate issues are somehow, uh, are somehow available in the open. So opposition research, we examine the, can the, uh, the records of candidates and, we op and, uh, and their opponents. We do opposition research on ourselves. We have to find out what the other guys are going to find out about us, right? We need effective means of analyzing the content that we locate about ourselves. And we need a, means, a way to take uh, the, the um, we need to, uh, we, we, once we have collected a bunch of content, for political purposes, whatever. We need to package them up and make them readily available. Let's say we want to do a press release, or we want to, uh, exa or we want to examine the record of a, a large body of data and so on. We need a specialist's opinion. There are all kinds of reasons to, to bring a disparate group of content together and package it for delivery. So you're all getting where I'm going with this, right? It's obvious what the next thing to do is, particularly if a guy like this is trying to sell it to you, right? Okay. Well, I tried to start a political research service firm that focused on PDF technology for delivering this functionality. But here's why I focused on PDF to return the subject to something that we're all slightly more familiar with. I, uh, I first saw my, a PDF in 1995 in Madison, Wisconsin. It was showed to me by probably one of the very few people before me to have previously purchased Adobe's Acrobat Capture 1.0 product, which was a, a, a piece of software uh, that's, that processes an input, uh, input TIFF file. 
performs OCR and outputs a PDF. This image isn't particularly remarkable to anybody today, and I, by the way, I apologize for the quality of the image. This is, in fact, the original image. I, I went and somehow found a few images from my old website for the purposes of this talk. This is an image from that website in which we try to explain to people the significance of text searchable PDF on an image file, right? So the idea of our, or my original firm was that we would scan in all, these pap all this paper, we'd OCR it, make it text searchable, You'd perform your text search, but the highlight that you'd see on that page once you found your hit, well, the highlight was on the image. It wasn't on the text, the actual text itself. The two things were not separate. Now, all the other competing solutions at the time characteristically retained an image and then retained text distinct from the image. You performed your search on the text, and then once you found your search, you, you kind of clicked the button to view the relevant page, and there it came and that was all the information the software was willing to give you. I was really struck by the fact that I could perform a, ta a seemingly perform a search against an image. I'm like, how does that happen? The guy says, that's OCR, Sonny. What's that? I had no idea. Remember, I've been working in politics. So he explains to me what's going on here, and I think that's really cool. And I look around at the other solutions, because I, I was bound and determined at this point to start a political service bureau that was doing stuff with documents. I look around at and, and, and all the other solutions in the marketplace for scanning and indexing documents and making them searchable for end users. I didn't see anything like this. Nothing that could take, bring the search together with the rendering or the actual document and present it to me so that I could go ahead and easily show it to somebody else and very confident in the fact that they would be looking at the real document and finding the stuff that I was wanting them to find. So there's, there my interest in PDF was born and I decided right then, within about 10 minutes of seeing this, uh, this demo at, at, at Knowledge in Motion's uh, um, uh, site there in Madison, I said, right, I'm gonna do this Imaging Service Bureau and I'm gonna use this thing called PDF, what, whatever that is. So I've, uh, I've done a little bit of digging around in the Wayback Machine, and I had to go to the Wayback Machine because uh, against my, my better uh, intentions or desires, I actually did not retain copies of all my websites from, from way back when. And when I dial the Wayback Machine to 1996, I can find a couple of shreds of my old website. Oh, I didn't update this slide. Or I, maybe I did. Okay, so... This is not, okay. So, um, okay. Um, so here I have now, these slides are, are not exactly what I thought they would be. That's fine. So here we have on the left, uh, my, my first company, Document Solutions Inc. Uh, began in 1996, moved to 2008 uh, when I was so sold it later. And I'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes. Um, as you can see from that rather strange looking page on the left side. Welcome to our website. Websites were pretty new back in 1996. Okay, we were pretty happy to have a website. We were, we were like, yeah, yeah, we have a website. <laughs> you have a website? Come look at our website. Don't forget to load the images. <laughs> so we provided, as you can see there, we thought we were, we were doing something still for the political people. But well, we were willing to take some business from other people too if they threw it our way, if we come up, could, come, could come up with something to satisfy them. This is back in 1996. So we said, and this was our mission statement, we provide research and document management, electronic republication communications tools. Um, that really, it, that we, I sold one of those, okay? One disc. We scanned a bunch of stuff for some Senate campaign, processed it. Burned a disk, made a little interface so you could navigate around that disk, send it out. Maybe charged them like $8,000 or something like this. Cost us probably significantly more than that to do it because we were still like, what's a scanner? What are we doing? By, uh, by, t by 2008, I'm happy to say, and of course it would have been impossible if we hadn't been able to happy to say it, I, I guess our website design skills hadn't improved dramatically over the, I have no idea what that background color is for. Um, but we had uh, at least figured out how to make money off of the idea of offering a service for, the, for, the, for handling PDF files in some way. Whether it's imaging documents, 
whether it was building an interface, and I'm going to cover that in a moment, or for, uh, uh, electronic forms and so on, we found a way to work with PDF to do things that people wanted it to do. In many cases, these things were, they wanted them to do just because they were, you know, they, they didn't know enough or didn't want to learn how to use Adobe Acrobat or some other tool to achieve this themselves. That was basically the, the case. We, we knew those tools fairly well. <clears throat> we could achieve this outcome, and they couldn't. We didn't get too much uh, press for our efforts as a, electro as a, as a, d a research service bureau for political organizations. In fact, this is the only press we got, uh, a little tidbit in the unconventional tidbits column from the San Francisco Chronicle. But for me, this is a, a little bit special in my heart because it, it kind of refers to the sorts of things that they're really only an analysis that's, that's leveraged by electronic document resources makes it possible to do. So we came up with this idea for getting press for our tiny little service bureau. Um, and actually, that slide is, is, is missing at this point. But I'll, I'll tell you that at this point, we were three desktops, a couple copies of Adobe Acrobat, one copy of Adobe Acrobat Capture, uh, one 20 page per minute scanner, and, uh, and, uh, and a table in my living room. Now, that was the company at this point. Um, but we took all these. We, we took all of the uh, the speeches from uh, from the uh, national conventions that year, and we downloaded them. <clears throat> they were actually available on the web, which is quite interesting. And we simply used uh, our search tools to to go through. Or we we simply used these tools to. Uh, we published it. The set is a collection of PDFs, of course, and used our tool to go through to and count the number of times that various terms were used by by various people and try and tell a story about it. This is our idea about how to sell the idea of uh, electronic um, uh, uh, document capabilities to p political professionals. Now, those people are, are real tight with the buck, let me tell you. Don't ever try and start a business selling stuff to political people. <laughs> Nonetheless, uh, that didn't work out so well, and that's a good thing because I don't think we could have made any money from it. By 2000, by 1998 or so, we had this amusing, uh, this amusing website, which is and logo, which was uh, kind of getting closer and closer to to uh, our, our PDF orientation and focusing on that. We'd added the ability to image large format <clears throat> pages. We had started developing uh, uh, CD-ROMs and so on. So, in, so beginning in 1996 we had we had begun to say we had begun to say you know what we're not only we're going to be scanning your documents for you but we're going to deliver them as pdf files and that's a big deal and we thought because everybody else in the space they were, they were delivering uh, that is to say in the high volume document imaging space was delivering tiff images because that's what the ecm systems at the time still consumed and and indexed well when i say indexed uh, OCR'd and, and then uh, processed and, and held thereafter. By the way, they still do that. They've added PDF support, that's good. But uh, ECM systems out there, at least in the United States, are still rooted in TIFF for the most part. And uh, I, I continue to find that curious. But happily, I'm not in the Imaging Service Bureau anymore, I Imaging Service Bureau business, and I'm happy to say that's not my problem. So as I mentioned, uh, we were all excited about uh, searchable image, or what was called, I believe back then, by Adobe um, search. Uh, I forget what it's called, but that's that's probably going on in my head right now. Um, but you can see here we had, we had, uh, we were really really high on the on the these very specific advantages that PDF brought to the question of what to how to get value out of imaging systems. In 1997, we came up with the first thing that, that we regarded, well, we said it was in an, an innovation. Now, of course, why not, right? Nobody else was saying to us that we couldn't say it was an innovation. We had this idea that if we take a single page from, an, let's say, an academic journal, and we scanned it twice, once black and white and once in color, then we could take those little zones of color images and we could delete or redact those same zones in the black and white page. We could OCR that black and white page and drop in those color zones into the right places in that page. This is not an automatic process. I hope you know. This is a completely manual process. Um, and that was, uh, and so we, and we marketed this extremely successfully, in fact, as multi resolution PDF. Before, I guess you'd have to say the days of, uh, of, of segmentation in OCR and, and, and image processing systems. 
Um, this, this really actually, uh, I'll be frank, this, this innovation, as it were, was the savior of Document Solutions, Inc. It allows, it allows us to expand our scope dramatically to include the world of publishers, of magazine publishers and academic publishers and others who, for, for them, what was really key in an imaging project where they wanted to, say, preserve the entire back catalog of their, of their journal was not so much that it was done quickly or that it was done for only 9.875 cents per page. That was what was critical to the people that we would service like Chevron or, or large law firms or other people who were paying us to scan you know, kilograms of paper or hundreds of kilograms of paper for the purpose of, uh, of, of supplying and servicing their lawsuits and so on. No, we found the uh, we, we we had a lot more fun with the multi-resolution PDF with servicing publishers and with people who really cared about their document and individual documents specifically, and we're re and we're really interested in added value to an electronic document. So we, we came up with this thing. We started pitching it in 1997, multi-resolution PDF, and we got a lot of uh, significant imaging projects as a result. We did uh, many, many uh, back catalogs of scientific journals and trade publications and product manuals, documentation, historical collections. Um, uh, the, the largest, the, the, the project of which were, uh, the, 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 the project that was, we're perhaps the proudest of, and you know, the, the folks who still remember this stuff, is we did all of Scientific American, which is the oldest continuously published magazine in the United States, started in 1847. And we handled that project uh, over a period of a couple of years in, in uh, around 2007, 2008, 2009. Um, one of those white glove projects where you, know, you have to pick up the piece of paper with, careful, with cotton gloves and place it gently on the scan bed and so on. Not exactly high volume imaging. Um, we did, from 1998, we added disk-based collections to our retinue. Now, these were also completely PDF-based. Our disks, uh, they would include, of course, the materials we had scanned or otherwise collected from electronic source. Uh, our disks were produced, um, first of all, by our imaging side of our unit, which would, which would generate the PDFs and ensure metadata was present and quality control and so on and so forth. And then in our disk development unit, when I say unit, I'm referring to probably three people at the time, uh, we would design, we would come up with artwork, design an interface, and uh, bring that interface together, all of it happening within PDF technology. So there were an awful lot of scripts and form fields and bookmarks and links and all kinds of crazy stuff going on in these PDF files so that we could present a, a, a UI to uh, end users uh, without leaving PDF technologies. All that was necessary to use this disk was, a, was a, at the time, Acrobat Reader. Um, you, know, you fire it up, aim it at the uh, home.pdf file at the top of the disk, and there you were away. Um, I actually don't have, I, I thought about trying to demo one of these disks for you, but um, then I decided against it. So you'll have to take my word for it. These screenshots really are from my old website. And um, they show off uh, bits and pieces of this. Uh, the United Nations yearbook collection was a rather interesting project, uh, trying to cram uh, large volumes of, of these pages into CDs, because you couldn't, you know, they didn't want to sell a DVD, as they were really afraid that, that other people would not be able to use it so well. But disk-based collections, as you know, they were kind of a limited lifespan in terms of utility out there in the world, because something came along called the web. Yeah, the web. Killed our disk collection business, stone cold. So as we proceeded forward, forward and, I'm, and I'm gonna skip over a few parts here, in part because I think I'm burning through my time considerably faster than I should be, uh, or thought that I would be, so I'm gonna speed it up. Uh, I was writing a lot about PDF and this and, uh, and, and reviewing this and that piece of software and coming up with promotional, with articles about this and that aspect of the technology in order to help people see uh, where, where, where uh, or basically actually is, is marketing material for ourselves, but also uh, because it just was very, very interesting to us, this idea of a document, what you could do with it, what it would mean. So over that period of time, over the, the, the time with Document Solutions, I came up with 
some perspectives on the industry so far. First of all, never ever start a business in the political research industry. Terrible idea. You'll lose money. You'll go broke. I don't recommend it. Electronic documents, however, there's a lot of potential in that space and it continues, I think, to this day and, and further forward. So I've, I've talked about the imaging services. I've talked about the, the disk services a little bit. I, I have, I've, sk I've skipped over, I will skip over the form services. Uh, the tag PDF services, we started doing that, right, it's just about as soon as, as, uh, as, as Acrobat uh, added that capability in, in 2000 or 2001. Um, essentially, we, would, we got into this place where we would track the new features in the software. We would learn how to use them right out of the egg. We were in the beta program and so forth, so we had you know, an opportunity to look at them ahead. Um, we we, would, we get, uh, get a sense of them, and then we would start marketing them basically as a service so we could provide to you just as soon as we were able. And so around 2002 or so, we completed this transition from volume imaging, which is very painful and involved my poor little company owning a van and having to drive around and collect boxes of paper in a van and, and even charge far less for scanning the van load of paper than we would charge for some relatively simple project for a publisher. Um, and we got that one more massive imaging project that was a Scientific American thing that we shouldn't have done or could have done. So what were the lessons that we learned from doing this, uh, the, from the Service Bureau work? First, people really trust PDF. Guess why? It looks like a, it looks like that familiar piece of paper. It converts nicely to that pre piece of paper. I can even take that PDF file, convert it to that piece of paper, printed. I can sign it, edit it, do something with it, scan it back in, turn it back into a PDF. That's interoperability. Interoperability with paper. Think about that. So interoperability matters to the world. To the world, that 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 feature of PDF, the fact that you could go out of PDF to paper, back to PDF, I saw that mattering all over the place. I, I saw nobody who could even conceive of the idea of a document in which that somehow wasn't going to be possible. Right? That was that seemed to be a really important criteria, and it, it occurred, and and it more and more seemed likely to me that why did, you know, in thinking more specifically or as specifically as I could about why PDF mattered, it seemed that it was because rendering mattered. Markup language stuff, um, the world of HTML, wonderful, amazing stuff. I love it. I'm never going to badmouth it, but it's not about a rendering. It's not about a document. It's not. It's not. It's distinct from the idea of this of this of this portable, flexible, extraordinarily interoperable format that um, that is that is that is itself that it exists as its own nature. That is not simply. A, a phenomenon of some other technology, such as uh, the constellation of a web server and a browser and a chunk of CSS and a piece of HTML. Those things come together at a particular instant in time to make an experience, but that's really quite different from a document. And PDF is, uh, well, that's what we thought back then. It's almost perfect, we said. Damn, that, that tagging is a little rough and maybe, that's the, maybe that system should be improved some, but, but we, we, we love PDF. Okay, so PDF isn't perfect, but it's it's not so badly broken. We felt that we that it that we could not imagine it living forever if we don't screw it up. So I ended uh, my career with, with Document Solutions Inc. by selling the company to a company in, in Pennsylvania, Applegen Soft uh, Applegen Document Solutions, then Applegen. I'm still there, still doing their thing, making a lot of PDF tools. And I'd like to offer you some lessons uh, from my time in the software development industry. No, oh, yeah, no, can't do that. So um, I can confirm the dates of hire only. So uh, I, I, I was the CEO of Applegen. That was one of the jokes you signed up for, by the way, earlier. <laughs> no? Uh, that was. So Appleton, uh, I was CEO of that company from 2009 to 2011, and then president of Netcentric from 2011 to 2013. I'd like to offer a revelation during my time here. Another one of those jokes that you signed up for at the front. Um, I'd have learned in the software development business, which I particularly enjoyed, and, and I actually, I'll be honest, I learned a lot more in the soft, as a software 
as a software vendor than I did as a service bureau vendor. But I had to be the service bureau vendor before I'd really appreciate what it meant to do software. Software is extraordinarily hard. Wow, I'm impressed. As somebody who doesn't write software, but has to watch people do it and see the results and work with the results, I know software is hard. PDF is particularly hard. It's extremely complicated. It's extremely diverse. It has many, many different opportunities for, uh, shall we say, making things interesting or perhaps even so interesting that they really can't be processed in any useful or meaningful way. Nonetheless, uh, however hard software is and however hard PDF is, software gets to change, but documents don't. You make a document, you stick it out there, and hey, that's a bunch of bytes. You know, what are you going to do with it now? As you better hope you can process it. So shipping new features, that's nice. Always great to ship new features, but if, if, uh, if the support costs, if the cost of handling the uh, constantly updating your software to deal with this and that and the other new interesting way to break a PDF file come along, it's going to be hard to ship new features. At the end of the day, that's what your customers really want to see is new features. Um, so documents from, so, and, and because, how do you manage support costs? You have to use, you have to use applicable standards. You have to decide when a thing is right and then be able to be willing or able to move on with it. And if somebody else does something in a way that's, that's, uh, that, 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 that's broken, uh, oftentimes, of course, in this being business, you have to go ahead and deal with it in some way that, that, it, that implies that you know, you're, you're willing to pr handle what somebody else did that was, that was broken. But nonetheless, um, from, from, uh, you know, in, in every aspect of communications technology, whether we're talking about the size of printer paper that you stick into a printer, right? just try and stick A4 paper into a US letter printer, see what happens. You know, it's not a good result. Um, to the PDF specification itself, you know, the, the, the greater extent to which we focus on standards is the extent to which we enable our own businesses and coincidentally, the businesses of others. But if we do so in a way that's, if we simply are paying attention to the standard, then we are, we are, we are participating in an effort that's good for us and it, and it raises all boats and by all boats, I, we include our own. So my history with standards. Uh, in 2000, as I mentioned, I started experimenting with tag PDF. That was interesting. In 2001, we said, well, we, we, we can do it. And it turns out that even that, uh, that uh, there is a there's screen reader technology out there that's willing to consume a tag PDF file back in 2001. So, so we, th we thought we were going to when the U.S. federal government uh, uh, started their Section 508 requirements, I believe it was June 15th of 2001, that regulation came online, I sat by the phone. I knew I was going to make a lot of money because I knew I was the only guy in the whole wide world who offered Section 508 compliance services for PDF files. Nobody else did it. I was certain of that. Phone didn't ring. Didn't ring. It's not the way the federal government works, as a matter of fact. But it did eventually begin slowly to ring. And we began to develop this service and, and added more and more of it over time. In 2004, I started sharing uh, AIMS because of the, all the problems we found and all the fights that we would constantly be having with our customers about whether or not a file was or was not correctly tagged. It became, and this is a support cost, let me tell you, it became necessary for us to engage in the activity of trying to establish what were the actual correct standards for tagging of PDF files. So I started working in the AIMS committee, which had been formed, uh, initiated actually by Adobe at the time, um, to search up, to, to figure out a best practice that could then be published and, and, uh, and put to use as a, as a, uh, to help people understand, you know, what, what was expected of tag PDF as opposed to just ran a bunch of structure elements applied to uh, very structure as it might appear. Um, so that, that was a long process, as you can see. It took, uh, I guess, something like eight years, now that I think about it, and several hundred meetings uh, before that, that process finally resulted in PDF UA, uh, PDF UA1 in 2012. And in the meantime, I got involved with 32, ISO 32000 
And for my sins, I was uh, I, I, I uh, made the mistake of raising my hand in 2011, and uh, was somehow became the project leader by so 32,000. Um, still not quite sure exactly why that happened, but nonetheless, it did, and I'm, I, I, I don't regret it. Uh, in 2017, um, after as after many years working on this document, we then published uh, myself and my uh, pro uh, project leader, co-project um, co leader, Peter Wyatt of Australia, uh, published ISO 32000 Part 2, um, the document that we had uh, both collectively spent a uh, couple thousand hours putting, uh, editing in various ways. I don't I don't know the total number of edits that went into it and so on, but I do know, you know I can guess at the number of meetings and so on. And it was, it was quite a volume of work and, and it gave me a deep, deep appreciation, even though I'm not a software developer, for the, for the, uh, the, the, the complexity and the majesty of this format. But I also noticed one key thing about the standards development. If there's only one party in the room with an opinion on the subject, it's not working. Uh, there have to be more than one. There have to be there have to be many more than one. Frankly, there's so many use cases for PDF technology. There's so many different things that people might legitimately want to do to a PDF file. That uh, apl application and serious contemplation of the standards, not just what the standard requires, but what it recommends. And what it and and what uh, and what other information one might glean from the standard and the best practices associated with the standard, and this is one of the reasons that I come to the to the PDF Association as, as somebody who discovered the discovered back when I was tagging PDF files how critically important it would be for for different people to agree on wh on what the specifications or what the requirements would be for tagging a document, and that principle extends all the way through. Uh, the, pro the, the, uh, the understanding, it seemed to me, of this, of this Im immensely complex, immensely sophisticated electronic document format that we all are relatively familiar with in this room. To do, uh, so you're probably wondering, uh, when is he going to get to PDF 2.0? Oh, yeah, I, I understand. Quicker, huh? Okay, yes, I see. All right, quicker. It's a community product, okay? I believe the most significant feature of this, of, this, of this document, as you might guess from my talk, is the fact that it enhances documentation for PDF. Yes, there are associated files. Yes, there's improvements to the tag PDF section. And there's this and there's that. There's many other features of, of PDF 2.0 that are good. But enhanced documentation, improving the quality of the standard is probably the most significant actual feature in the standard. It results in improved interoperability, re reduced development support costs, and so on. So there'll be five key features of next generation PDF as I see it, interoperability and transparency. You know, we're going to talk about more of these during the various sessions today. All right, there is tend to be, and the new slide says vendor neutral, not technology neutral, which is really what I intended. Um, but the key features of PDF going forward will be neutrality. It will, it will be that uh, the PDF is fully exposed to the, the as it is today, to the, to the various implementers who wish to do interesting things with it. Now, there are countercurrents in the PDF space. There are companies out there that grudgingly support the technology, but they have no, no special interest in it in themselves. They just kind of have to do it because, hey, PDF is the electronic document technology. There's PD, PWP out there, which is also uh, a very interesting initiative by W3C and, and, and seeks to take on a key part of what PDF's uh, space ha is all about. Um, where did that slide go? Oh, this is quite old. Okay. Um, so, and I, I, I found very interesting in the front end to the PWP discussion here, uh, this discussion, this description of the uh, of, of the the function of books versus the web, and uh, and how this distinction is is handled here, and um, uh, and uh, which I'll refer to in a moment. So yeah, that was the problem. The slides were mixed up. So is the question that we will have that everybody will have for PWP or other technologies that come along that might that might compete with it. Is it 
easier or is it as capable, is it flexible, right? These are the things that, that the users will want to know before you're going to take away their PDF file. Is it do all these things as well as PDF? That will be the key, the key for that point. So there are counter counter currents. You know, it's not just up to the Googles of this world to tell us what our electronic documents formats will be. The users most definitely have a voice. The users already know that HTML is an experience and not a document. They don't have any. They 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 they, uh, they have a sense of this as you as you can see from the bottom here. Um, HTML is, of course, uh, and that slides that statement is incorrect. Nonetheless, uh, the idea is that is that their websites are becoming ever more a confection, a constellation of things that happen that come together only for a particular second in time, that aren't just about uh, that aren't about a document that can't even necessarily be repeated at all. So, but the idea of a document exists; it persists; it's not going anywhere. It's this other stuff that is. That is not that 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 need not they need not be here yesterday, need not be here tomorrow, and you think about this right? How do people? I've noticed people document the web with a screen capture. What is with that? So I'm going to talk more about this later, and since I'm out of time, I'm not going to talk about it now. But I believe there is a solution to the idea that the that the guy writing in the introduction for PWP discusses. Um, P, PDF is already bounded but open or it can be more open. And more importantly, it's already accepted. So I'm going to talk about in the final session we have today, the, uh, at my, uh, where there's a panel on five visions for a PDF future, I'm going to talk a little bit about PDF package. And uh, because I'm going to talk about it there, I am not really going to talk about it here because I am out of time, I believe. Nonetheless, uh, in that session, I will, I, will, uh, I will extol upon the idea that in PDF, we have the opportunity to create something that combines, uh, that, that, that allows users to package a variety of electronic, of, of information formats together for purposes, um, for the purposes of documenting content. And that a rendering is the key organizing principle for this, much as that se might seem uh, strange to the folks who prefer to work in terms of HTML and CSS and JavaScript. And it'll be very important to support PDF 2.0 and, and, uh, and, and, uh, in, in this context. And, uh, but again, I will, be, I will cover that a little later. So I want to end here by offering you a thought about the, the history of communications technology. And we've had, uh, you know, the invention of language was uh, somewhere between 100 and 200,000 years ago. That uh, was pretty important. Uh, you know, before that, uh, or so we're given to believe that humans communicated by mm, bashing each other over the, the head or grunts or something like that. Uh, cave painting, around 40,000 years ago. That was a very important way of marking up, you know, how many bison you'd killed in the last week. Make sure that uh, the other guys around the corner couldn't couldn't claim any more. Writing now we're getting beginning to get more sophisticated, and paper allowed us to communicate those things that we wrote in much more uh, in a much more readily readily portable fashion. A printing press allowed us to do it on a massive scale, and the PDF format allowed us to do it in electronic context, which made it which made uh, the process of communications technology instant and worldwide. The next step is entirely up to you. Where will we go from here? Will PDF persist? Will it be the last stop on this, communica on this communications technology timeline? I suspect it won't. And some people are saying, well, where's, where's the web on this? Yeah, when the web, start, when the web is all about a document, you let me know. I don't think it's there yet. Uh, last day, I'd like to simply say that thank you for letting me do this. <laughs> <laughs>